and let me unmute myself. That would be really good, wouldn't it? Okay. I think we're I think we're there. I think we're we're all here. Um and by all I mean you and me, Kim. Um <laughs> Welcome to this, um, uh, a slightly haphazard put together, but but all in all, good event for us to do. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Good chats popping up. Um, I love it. Um, cool. Thanks, everyone, for sort of waiting patiently for that minute there. Um, as we get ourselves together, welcome to to this, um, an Intergames uh, live streamed event where we are joined by Kim McCaskill. Um, who we, we're going to be talking just a little bit, quite gen sort of quite openly about like narrative design, about the games industry, about what that role is, um, about how people can get into it. Um, we can talk a little bit about Kim's kind of personal experiences um, in that role, uh, and maybe maybe your journey, Kim. Um, but but rather than me sort of fill in the blanks, why why don't I allow you to sort of introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit about um, sort of who you are uh, and what your relationship is to the sort of the games industry, actually, just just as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, firstly, guys, thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, my name is Kim, and uh, I've been in the games industry since about, I want to say, 2015. Uh, and to be honest, I, I fell into games completely by accident. I, I initially started failing in television. I would get the odd gig here and there uh, as a writer. And it was only when I realised that there was such a thing as a games writer. I think previous to that, I never really thought that there would be a position for someone like me. And it, being a huge, huge, huge Batman fan, uh, it turned out that Rocksteady were looking for a writer at that time. And it was very much a time where games were starting to recognize that games needed bigger stories. You know, we were starting to have BAFTA award-winning uh, story games like God of War and so on. So I think off, off the back of, of, of this demand, games started to stop just using a designer to fill in gaps where lines should be. They actually started to look for writers and we're going, look, we will teach you how to how to work in games if you can bring your writing expertise. So really, it's a long way of saying it was a very different time back then. You know, it wasn't like it is now, but it is very difficult to get in. Um, it, it was a case of, it was like a dark guy in an alleyway going, do you want to work in a game? And I was like, yes. And then that, that was really how it started. And, and I learned games probably from the most humble place possible, which was, going into a studio and really not knowing any terminology at all not knowing like really how narrative worked in a game and until I joined and that's kind of what I want to talk a bit about here today uh if you're going to take any message away from anything I say today it is that no one knows completely what they're doing games is forever an innovative uh, art form and it always changes which means everyone is learning all the time no one is ever really an expert in this um so that's how i started and from there um working on games like suicide squad and fable i went on to become a narrative lead for league of legends um which, which i loved very very much and then kind of worked my way to become a narrative director for playstation where i created my own ip which has not been announced yet uh, and you know what in between i've worked on mobile games I, i've worked on uh, car games i've worked on a variety of lots of different types of games so so um so with that narrative the the, the demand for narrative and the shape of narrative changes uh so i'm happy to to answer uh, any questions that, that we have here i'm seeing everyone saying hello and i'm saying hi back to you uh everyone from gavin and all the way down to, to roll and roll. It's a great name. Don't know what it means, but oh, it's a D and D reference. Anyway, this is what we're working with. I'm a bit slow today, but uh, yeah, absolutely delighted to to be here and to talk to you about all of these things. And as per, I've done Q and A's before, and I know that as soon as people start asking questions, that is where the bulk of this is going to go. So I don't want to talk too much about me because. I've been to Q and A's before where people do give a very rehearsed spiel on who they are and what they do. This is an hour for you guys. So I want to make this specifically for you guys to have an opportunity to come in. Um, so, so Jonas, how do we want to do questions? Because I think we should just get to it. Um, how do you want to start this? Yeah, absolutely. So what I would say to everyone in chat now is um, when when questions occur to you, throw them straight in chat and I will be I will read out your questions to Kim. Kim, obviously, take as much time as you need to to answer that question, um, you know, because let's face it, like, you're, you're a font of experiences and knowledge that everyone wants to drink deep from. Um, <laughs> I won't take that metaphor any further. But um, uh, in the meantime, you know, I've, I've already got some surface level questions that I think can really start a discussion. And then in the meantime, you know, everyone in, in the chat, please do feel free to start asking your questions as we dig into a conversation. 
Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, so I, I guess like we'll, we'll we'll start with I want to start from zero, Kim. I want to start with I can hold a pen and I can put it to paper, but when am I a, when am I a writer? Right? Like when does that come true? Like do I am I good at writing tweets? Am I good at writing a eighty thousand page long book? Like where would you say that someone? How, how would you sort of identify someone as being sort of? a writer or sort of being ready to take that into a career space, particularly in the games industry, or, and I suspect this will be the real answer, is it just too nebulous to really say that there is a defined line? I think the moment you realise you are a writer is is when you pick up the pen. And, and I think that is the scariest thing to do. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm a writer when I'm published. I'm a writer when I've finished that book or that script. And absolutely not. I think the moment that you are brave enough to pick up a pen, what you have stated is I have a story to tell. And in, in my, my opinion, that means that you are a writer. Now, the difference between being a writer and being a good writer is 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 recognizing what type of writing you're passionate about because once there's passion there's hunger and once there's hunger you want to improve anything i've written any first draft of anything i've written is awful and always will be but it's about finding that hunger that's going to make you brave enough to write badly be brave enough to write badly and eventually you'll redraft it you'll come back and again this is where the bravery is and eventually you'll get a good product but the moment you pick up a pen you're a writer right so just to be, that's you a writer. How are you going to be a good writer? You've got to be passionate. You've got to be hungry enough to get to that good product because it's not going to be good the first time you put pen to paper. It's going to be awful. This is where people can start to get a little bit paralysed and they think, oh, I don't want to write that because it's terrible. Write it anyway. Write the worst possible thing you can write and then see if there's anything in there that you want to improve on. Because what you're looking for are sparks of, of interest for you. Um, anytime I write something, I might write, say, five pages of something and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is all terrible. But there's a little spark, there's a little back and forth of the character, there's something there and I'm like, oh, but I like that, I like that. And then it's almost like the other pages don't exist. I want to pull out that one bit that I do like because that's that's fueling me to, to keep redrafting. It tells me that there's something there that's worth making better. If you believe that your ideas are good enough and that you love your ideas enough, then the writing is just, it. the writing is almost secondary. It starts with an idea that you believe in and then the writing is just getting brave enough and not shaming yourself out of reworking a story until it serves the idea you have and the way that you want it to do. But to go back to answer your, your initial question, there's no point in your established career where you can go, well, I'm a writer now. As soon as you decide that you are going to pick up that pen, you're a writer, as far as I'm concerned. Wonderful stuff. Thank you very much. Um, and in in the time that we've sort of talked about that, we we do in fact have we have opened the floodgates to questions from a, from an audience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of carefully make my way down. I notice that there are some common themes in certain questions. Ooh. So where those themes reoccur, I think I will kind of bundle them into one topic. Um, but I suppose the, the very top question you you mentioned that one of you know you you started writing for Batman right um which presumably was the the arkham series of games mm. um and so we've got brie in chat just saying did you work on one of the arkham games if so what was that experience like and i guess really what i'd like to hone in there is like that's a triple a that's a massive um ip it's a massive character who's internationally famous that's not going from indie to to something big that's mm -hmm. starting big mm -hmm. so that must have felt quite monumental in some capacity you know like i'm a batman fan as well truly so yeah i can only imagine what that must have felt like but now rather than imagine let's let's hear it yeah i mean i can tell you when i got that job it was it was emotional it was honestly emotional because I didn't think that going from little bit part writing gigs that I'd get from the BBC, which would always be very, very tiny, I didn't think anyone was going to be willing to trust me with an IP that was that big, and especially one that I really loved. And I know that I was hired based on my pre-existing knowledge of, the, of DC Comics. This was, as far as I, this was a dream come true. I remember telling my mum, my mum cried before I did. You know, that, that was a reaction to getting a gig like that because I think anyone knows when you are giving your everything to try and get 
the job that you want. I, I used to call myself the the uh, the bridesmaid of, of job interviews because I'd get interviews and never the job. You know, it, and that went on for eight years and it really was starting to not just get me down, it was starting to hurt. Because there's one thing I'm saying, it's like when you care about your career so much, it becomes a part of your identity. And then when it's not working, that can be a very hurtful identity to have. So for me, getting that, that, that gig with the Batman games was, it was such a breakthrough moment where it was like, oh my God, finally, someone's taking me seriously enough, someone's seen that, that I can offer something. And in, and on top of that, the difference between TV and games is they took me on initially for two years. Now, as a writer being told I've got a job for two, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Um, and and so what I did with with this those games was I kind of came in at the bridging point between Arkham Knight and, and Suicide Squad. And, and the reason for that is because there was discussions that was to whether or not Suicide Squad was going to be canon or not and and that's kind of where I was coming in and to kind of go if it is canon then we've got some issues because some characters from Arkham Knight are dead <laughs> uh Deadshot was white is, is now black you know, things like that we had to kind of address it in the moment so that's really where I came in and I think that's when they specifically wanted someone who came from a different background to come in and go how do we develop this story further and how do we take characters that maybe we have it put in a lead role capacity, people like Harley Quinn and, and Boomerang and King Shark. How do we make them main characters that people want to play and, and so on? So that that's really where, where I came in with a bit more TV development, character development skills. Um, and so that that's how I started there. But but to explain it, you know, I will never not be humble about it. And um, regardless as to what happens in any job that you do, I, I will always be so grateful for for getting that, that opportunity. Um, I got the the gig after being told to do a writing test, and I'd never been more excited to do free work. I now actually refuse to do unpaid writing tests, but at that point, I, I would have done an unpaid novel. You know, if they wanted me to talk about Batman characters, I was like, give it to me. It's like just that that sheer joy of being able to not just show my writing. But to do it with characters, I would never have imagined in a million years I'd get to to tell these stories with, and it was it was it was just pure joy. And and to get the role again, I cannot emphasize enough how I was very much aware that I got my dream job after almost a decade of of trying and rejections. And and I used to get within the first year of writing, I had a rejection folder that I told myself I would look back on once I achieved amazing success. That folder lasted about six months before I had to shut it down because <laughs> I couldn't deal with the amount of rejections that were there. Uh, so call, call it call me a bit of a romantic, I think most writers are, but it gives you an idea as to what that struggle was. Um, so, so to get that, it, it meant it meant the world to, to get that opportunity when, when it came through. That's yeah, monumental, in, in, incredible, and and so you know you can definitely feel sort of that 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 feeling from you, like those, those feelings are so uh, engageable and real. Uh, I I could feel myself welling up at the idea of me writing for Batman, um, <laughs> but 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 I I won't live your life for you. No 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 no. Um, <laughs> but what I what I'd love to know now, um, there's there's definitely like a uh, sort of a good topic here in the in the chat, which is um, this idea of where are the jobs where are the jobs where are they hiding <laughs> where, like who who's who's being sneaky with them um there's some commentary on you know is is it as simple as getting the right discords and just keep networking um is it you know is 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 someone just slamming all the writing jobs in a secret unlisted website that can mm -hmm. only be found out through referrals um you know, mm -hmm. in terms of it, especially for juniors, you know, where where are these opportunities or, or where aren't they? You know, I think they're hidden behind a, a multi-layered excuse pattern that I've noticed in the games industry. And it's something that that I find particularly frustrating and some people might be aware already. But I started a program called Play It Forward which was a one year mission statement based on this, because everything that I'm seeing game devs experiencing now, that's why I experienced in TV when no one wanted to take me seriously because I was young, because comedy at that point didn't really want female writers, you know, because um, I didn't have an agent. You know, all these barriers I was really struggling to get against. And here were people that had maybe written an episode of EastEnders and, and they're getting all the gigs. And I'm like, why aren't they taking a chance on, on new fresh talent? And why won't they give me that opportunity? Because I would write a million scripts to, to demonstrate and showcase, but even getting someone to read them was hard enough. So it felt like everything was kind of set against me. And in games, I have noticed this a lot. Now, I do think that there is a little bit of companies dragging their heels a bit with offering the odds 
junior position but this has been something that I've been actively pushing for and part of the play it forward thing was whenever I was getting an excuse going we can't afford it in the budget we don't have time to train the people up and this is where I tried to put a thing across going well look I know I get paid pretty nicely for a, cons a consultancy fee I thought see if I don't get paid that you could probably pay someone for a month in a junior position to do that so I'll do that for free you pay them and what if I could get other experts in their own fields to to do the same can we start making a space because even that one month and this is what it comes down to it is getting that one break when you get that one break the doors open up and the hardest thing sadly is getting that one break because you're right because where are the jobs and how do we get that one break it's the most frustrating thing um so, so what where are they and what are they doing they, they are there it's just it's very different to how it was when I started but I do empathize from TV it's a lot of networking it's a lot of demonstrating your work it's it's a lot of uh, to be honest knocking doors um now to give you an example of how this happened with with me and TV I can and I'm quite open about it now when TV um when I was really struggling in my mind I used to look at people like Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg and so on and they'd all made it at 25 right Somehow I had a breakdown at 25 because I had not in any way progressed and I felt like I had put everything into this career. And what it took was I was knocking every single door. I was literally posting scripts to people that didn't want to accept them. I was doing everything I could do. I used to, and please don't do this, what I used to do is I genuinely would take pride in not sleeping if it meant I was working to get closer to my goals. Don't do it, that doesn't work. But that's the kind of thing that I was doing. I thought if I can give fate is less is less of an opportunity to not give me what I want eventually I'll get what I want and it wasn't happening what happened was is I burned out badly but what actually really helped me and I didn't expect this to happen and this is when I was really at my lowest point is um I contacted an exec producer and he worked at BBC Scotland at the time and I was almost because normally you know you go and you always want to be sunny and be like yay I'm the sunniest most positive person to be around please hire me please hire me that that mask at that point for me totally slipped and I was like I don't know what I'm doing wrong can you please tell me what I'm doing wrong I know it's not your job to tell me what I'm doing wrong but this is what I've done I've done this course which I I went bankrupt over because I couldn't afford to pay the fees I went bankrupt um trying to get a course that I thought would get me a job so I was bankrupt in my, in my mid-20s I was like this is what's happened this is what's happened I can't afford to keep doing this but I feel like I've tried everything can you just tell me what I'm doing wrong and I was really lucky because at the back of that, what I got was a very human response, which I actually hadn't had up until that point. And that was someone who understood, who actually saw me as a human and saw what I was trying to do. And, and he invited me in for a coffee. And that's all it was. It was just a coffee. But just having someone wanting to listen to me was huge. And, and off the back of that, he gave me a, a six month contract as, as a producer covering someone's maternity. And it was like a junior, 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 junior producer role. But once I got that, people saw it on the CV and they took me seriously. So I think this is a long way of me saying for people, where are the jobs? Why is it hard? What do I do? There's no A to B in this. There's no formula to get a job. There's no little blacklist somewhere that's saying you're not good enough. And, you know, they're, they're not judging you as harshly as you think. You might be going in thinking, oh, well, they're not going to go for me because of this. They're not going to go for me because of that. It's, it's really probably not all those things that you're feeling insecure about. Knock the doors. Don't be embarrassed about knocking the doors. You're not begging. You're not panhandling. You've got a skill and, and, and you want to be able to demonstrate it. This is where people like myself do get emails a lot and I do respond to, to every single one of them. I might not be able to tell you exactly how you'll get a job, but I'll definitely listen. And I think if you can do that with as many recruiters and people in the industry as possible, it works. And, 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 to, and to kind of add to that, choose people. Choose people to reach out to who make the things that you like, who make the things that seem similar to what you want to do. Because when you get a copy paste message from someone who you think has been sent to 50 people, you may be like, ah, you know, this isn't really about me. But if you can make it personal enough to go, I know what you do. I know what you make. This, this is what I make. And this is why I'm contacting you. You might find that people are more likely to get back to you with, with conversations. And again, it may not lead to a job, but you're in someone's brain, you're in someone's mind, and they're not just going to see you as a 2D smiley face trying to you know do all the tap dancing. They're going to see you as a human who is trying. Um, and so it's not to say, you know, give them a sob story, but show them the work that you've been doing to try and get that opportunity 
they might not have one right away, but if ever they're thinking, who's a junior that could really benefit from this? They're going to remember what you've gone through and they're going to remember that you actually might stylistically be a match for a project that they're working on. It's 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 a, it's such a difficult time, especially with the layoffs. You know, we can't discount that. They, I think that there's so many people that I know that are at expert level that are leaving the industry because of how bad that is. I do think the wheel will turn again and opportunities will um, turn up again, um, especially with regards to what we used to call AAA gatekeeping. Um, I would say right now it has never been better to not have to need a AAA studio for your your CV. I think those days are, are very quickly coming to an end because they just don't have the security that they have anymore. They don't really have the flex that they had anymore. Um, so what I think is going to happen off the back of that is we are seeing more indie studios opening up. Um, so I do think there are probably going to be more opportunities for juniors coming along. With that being said, be very careful that you're not being exploited because, as I always say, as soon as desperation is there, it isn't long before exploitation follows. Be very careful about what industry do you speak to. Uh, don't do free work. Um, having a portfolio is good to good to go. You know, if you want to do a paid test, fantastic. But don't don't put yourself in a position where you make yourself look like you will do free work because there are unfortunately some individuals that are using this period of time to, to, to take advantage. But getting back to the good point, I do think with this new wave of indie studios, hopefully, hopefully we will see different types of talent get getting an opportunity. I'm really hopeful of that. Sorry, I did go on a tangent there. I've just got so much to say on that subject that it's like six points coming to my head and I'm like, boof, but hopefully someone took something from that <laughs> I mean, and yeah it's it's all super valuable it all needs to be said and it's all insightful and the fact is it's all true like yeah you know that there's there's absolutely nothing but relevancy in everything that you said there so um please do just just expand as much as you need to because it's all going to be really valuable um we've talked a lot about uh sort of um your your experience and and sort of jobs and and things like that but um we've not talked a lot about the actual the actual art of writing you know the actual sort of your 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 personal input into creating these characters these worlds and and, and stories um so there's a good question from uh seth here and there's um i think a, a similar one down below which is um how how do you write characters or stories that your audience may relate to more than you do on a personal mm -hmm. level so how do you write for someone else rather than writing for yourself is sort of mm -hmm. i think a good way to rephrase that question so this this is a very big question, okay, because it, it, it's one thing to write for, say, a male character because I'm not a man, as, as opposed to writing for, say, someone who is blind. You know, I don't have, you know, there, there's very different levels of that. I have to say any time where I am wary of how I'm representing the wants and needs of a character who's walking a very different walk of life from me, research, 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 research. There's a lot of charities out there who are happy to talk, uh, who are happy to have consultants, uh, uh, like a consultancy thing with you. If it means getting the representation told well, then it really helps me as a writer. Um, you know, we had a character in the game once who who was, I think, had uh, to who who was pretty much blind, and believe it or not, this person was a mechanic. Now, this was based off someone that I actually interviewed who had two percent vision but was a car mechanic and their brothers were car mechanics and they were also partially blind and things that you know we wouldn't ever imagine to be possible I couldn't create characters like that unless I knew that they existed in real life and I was able to talk to them in real life and go this is how I'm thinking of portraying this character what 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 are your wants in life what are your fears in life how do you trying to get that research there is absolutely invaluable so I don't go too far into a character that I don't know without doing that research first once I think I've got enough research to start. Uh, again, it's going down to the phrase I just used, what a character wants and what a character uh, needs. Because what I can tell you is what a character thinks they need is very rarely what they actually need. And that is where you get a fun character. A character who, say, for example, thinks everything is going to be better when they get their ex back. That's all they need. If they can just get their ex back, their life is going to be perfect. Actually, that's not what they need. They need to learn a bit of independence. They need to learn how to love themselves. You know, these are very basic kind of um, contrasts. But as soon as you get that inner conflict, that's when you get a good character. And as you build on that and as you write on that and you introduce other characters, 
then you start to look at character relationships and you want to ask two questions. What are, what's one thing these two characters can bond over and unite over? And what's one thing that they can fall out over? Like what's going to unite them? What's going to divide them? Because with that, you will always have a dynamic that you can throw to get them to be where you need to be, uh, depend, depending on the story. So this is all character development before we even get to the story. And really what the storyline is, it, it, most of the time is a wall that these characters are going to constantly bounce off of and show these these sides of them. That's what you really want to do with a storyline. But at the beginning and de developing a character, research, get the building blocks of what they want and need, and, and then start thinking about the dynamics, if, if that helps. I think that's a very quick fire way of doing it. There's more to it, but that's how that's how I personally start. So. Oh, there's there's going to be so much more to everything we talk about, right? But the fact is, is uh, we would we would need a lot more room to kind of really dig into everything that we're talking yeah. about here. I mean, one um, thing, I, one thing I can say, if you ever want to do a quick exercise uh, in terms of is my dialogue got enough of that character's voice in it, send it to other devs that you're working with. Don't give the the character name of the dialogue and ask them to see if they can work out who said it. And if they can work out who said it, then you know you've got your character voice in play. And I do that all the time. That's that's a really cool exercise. I love the idea of that. Um, this feels like a good moment, by the way, to sort of mention the, that there is, an, there is an elephant in this room, um, Kim. It's in neither of our cameras, but it exists within this digital space, which is there is a context to us speaking. Um, and there is a context, you know, because uh, you, you have you have a relationship with Intergames that exists outside of just you and me speaking. Yes. Um, and that is that Intergames is um, sort of uh, hosting and organizing these courses. They're called sprint courses. Yes. Um, they're, they're three weeks long. And they take place in sort of the evening, like 6 p.m. or sort of six till eight ish. Right. So the idea is if you have a full time job, if you're in full time study, you should be able to get home, sit down, jump on your webcam and still be able to participate in these courses. Mm -hmm. um, we've done these courses before in concept art, in uh, leadership and programming, in level design. Um, and I believe, Kim, you know, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth exactly, but I believe um, there is actually one coming up that might involve yourself. Mm -hmm. um, do we just want to talk a little bit like a sort of a two minute quick Sure. What what would that course what would that course do? What's your vision for that course? What would you like people to take away from those courses? Because I feel like mm -hmm. that's an important part of yeah. How do people develop? How do people learn more? And I think yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, so I started talking to Declan from Into Games about a year ago about potentially doing something like this, and and I'll be very vocal about it because because I am in general. Uh, I have a bit of an issue with the amount of courses that are being made available worldwide and are charging 10 to 20 grand for a student to, to learn something and being taught by people who don't even work in games. Because what I've noticed being on the hiring side of things is that I'm getting given these very cookie cut portfolios that are just not industry standard. And the thought of these people getting that money, scraping that money, doing what basically I did and had to go bankrupt over, it absolutely grind, grinds my gears. And I know that a lot of these courses I probably could boil down to six lessons. I don't think people do need to, to save 10, 20 grand to learn them. So when speaking to Declan about doing a sprint course, I thought, you know what? I'm going to do six sessions and I'm going to put tasks in there. And what I'd really like for these people at the end of this course to have is a portfolio based on the exercises that they can then have. And I know that when they send it to, to narrative teams, they'll, they will be more inclined to look at it and go, ah, this is actually what we're looking for in a narrative designer. This is actually what is an industry standard template um, of, of what we would hope to see in the day-to-day -day working, as opposed to what, what some of these uh, push students are actually turning out with at the end. So that, that's what inspired me to do it. And yeah, so it's going to be six lessons. We're going to be looking at world building, dialogue systems, a process which are called DNA, which uh, stands for design narrative art, which we use particularly at Riot Games, uh, and looking at where you involve yourself as a narrative, how you lead as a narrative, also how you support as a narrative, the different types of games and how narrative gets involved. It's, I, I, we're going to be looking at lots of different uh, areas, cinematic scenes, character development, location by bios people don't tend to think about those things but i'm going to be making them write them uh, because it is useful and it's very important so that's that's what i'm hoping to do and you know i i was so shocked because with this sprint um i advertised it quite quickly Declan let me advertise it very quickly and it sold out in under three days i was i was gobsmacked 
uh, to be honest. So Declan has asked if I will do another one. So we actually have another one in July. And it's, and I can't say it's only through Jonas. I only found out because I came into this a couple of minutes beforehand. Jonas has now told me that it's now half sold out already. Um, the way it's going to go, right, is, is, is I'm going to do the April one and I'm going to do the July one. It will be the exact same thing. Uh, I might even do a third one. I, I, I don't know yet. If I've got the time, I'd really like to. Uh, because again, I, I, do, I don't think people need a two year course to learn this. I, I came in as a non-game writer and it was what my lead at the time referred to as a baptism of fire. When you get thrown into it, you learn fast. And and not to say that I'm going to be putting people through a boot camp, but I do feel like it can be taught quickly. Um, well, quick, quickly-ish. No, like I said, no one's ever an expert, but if you want to go in and be like, I kind of have an idea, I can get you to the I kind of have an idea stage <laughs> as best as I can. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, thanks for, for sort of expanding on that, and and yeah, it just it just sounds super exciting. Like I having having seen some of the sprint courses before, I just I know how how kind of exciting and how invigorating it is to sit down with someone who, who really knows what they're talking about, and for them to just say it to you one to one, and you you get that relationship out of it as well. Like that that is sort of a, a nice little perk of the entire thing is you really do build a relationship not just with the the course leader but with a lot of other people who are very likely to be next to you parallel in the industry for years to come. You know, the fact is, is if you're in a class of, of sort of 15 narrative designers and writers, the chances are is you're all going to move, move up slowly at your own pace together in the industry, which is great because it just means you're going to kind of ebb and flow in and out of each other's kind of networks and circles and professional sort of um, lives. I think there's something really, really just beautiful about those types of communities that sort of move in and out of each other. Mm -hmm. so yeah um thanks for expanding on that um i'm super excited for it i have with the power of technology made this scrolling banner of text at the bottom of the screen appear um which tells you not only the link where these courses are into games um into games dot courses um mm -hmm. but if you use uh, if you use this code kim event 15 uh, you get 15 percent off. off but more more importantly one thing i cannot emphasize enough is if you are in a position where you can't afford to pay for it yeah okay. i've been there 100 percent there talk to into games because um if, if you are in a certain position it might be that we can allocate you a, a free place in the course basically this isn't just for people who have money we, we wanted to make this as affordable as possible but if you are struggling don't rule yourself out get in contact um, with into games because it's there for a reason it is a charity it's here to try and help people get the training and an access that they need so yeah just just a wee reminder yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, Intergames' is primary focus is supporting people from low-income backgrounds. So mm -hmm. um, we have resources to basically always support people who who do have that background, who who do need that financial support. Um, it does it does require emailing us. You know, we we, we don't know you need the help unless you, you let us know that you need the help. So please do just drop an email. Um, email, we're at hello at Intergames, or you can email sprints at Intergames if you're more specifically wanting to talk about the sprint courses. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I let, let's get back on track let's back to our sort of um open q a and things like that and let's um just looking back through the chat and by the way there's, yeah. there's some there's some millions really of questions i'm struggling to keep up i've had to apologize i'm like i can just see all these things popping up and i'm like i'm not rude i'm just i'm just i'm trying to like focus and uh, what we'll see is uh, after the end of this because i know we've only got x amount of time left if there's any question that wasn't answered um i am on the discord i will spend a little time afterwards trying to answer, answer a couple of questions and again if you're not there for that I am on Twitter I know it's not the best platform uh, but you know I, I am there so feel free to ping me on that as well yeah if, if you're a member of the discord intergames discord um then there's a channel called questions and answers please do use that channel to ask your questions um it's purpose built uh if you're not a member of the um intergames discord um then why not um uh it's hard for me to give you an invite link right now in this chair in this human form um but we should be very easy to find um if you head over to the intergames website um or just just reach out just reach out find us on linkedin intergames me jonas garway i'll send anyone a discord link who wants it and i can pop it in the um youtube comments in just a moment actually if that's helpful um now i've realized that i've got the function to actually bring questions up on the screen so i'm going to do that as i read out yes. this next question um so i've got a question from uh lucy saskia it says do you have any advice for dealing with imposter syndrome i love writing i love my work but it can feel very isolating so i get a lot of doubts about what i'm doing uh, i would say Firstly, that imposter syndrome, 
the bad news is that is never going to go away. That never goes away. It doesn't matter what level you're at. It doesn't matter how many jobs you've had. It doesn't matter how many awards you've won. That is never going to go away. The best advice I can give you is learn to love it. And I know that sounds very, very strange, but when you are having doubts, take that moment, have a breath and go in. You're having doubts because you care about whether or not you're doing well. See if you don't have that care. See if you didn't have that worry. You wouldn't do good writing because you're not getting that push. Use that Use that doubt to go, okay, I've got the doubts, but I'm going to write it anyway. And even if it's bad, I'm going to learn from it. Don't let imposter syndrome stop you from writing. Because that is it. When I did stand up, we used to have this thing. I did stand up comedy for six years before I was a writer. And we used to say, if you're not nervous before you go on stage, you are going to die on your ass. 100%. You're not going to perform well. You need to have nerves. You need to have doubts. It's going to keep you on your toes. So it's uh, try and, and instead of going, oh, I'm not good enough, trust that you are good enough. But this thing telling you that you're not is actually just a very toxic parent trying to get you to do well. Just see it as that. Drain the noise out, but just use that feeling as a reminder that you care enough to do well. Don't let it overwhelm you to the point that you're not going to write. Just see it as a sign of, oh, if I'm getting this, this means I care. And if I care, that means I'm meant to be doing this. And eventually it stops being the overwhelming demon that it normally is. It never goes away, but it's a reminder that you're doing the job that you want to do because you care. That's how I'd see it. It's just a reminder of that. Don't see it as anything more than that. And again, there's absolutely no one that you will meet in this industry, no matter how they present themselves, especially if they do present themselves as overconfident, they probably have it the worst. In almost every time that I've experienced uh, people with certain attitudes and so on, it never goes away. So in a sense, you're not alone. And that's another aspect of it. Everyone has it. It's just about how you manage it. And again, boil it down to if you have it, it means you care. And that's a good thing. Nice. Thanks very much. Like, yeah, I've, entering the entering the industry, it is it is everywhere. You know, people of all ages, of all seniorities, of all expertise. Imposter syndrome comes up like so frequently. You know, especially when we talk about that that kind of um, that diversity and inclusivity angle, where um, you get a lot of people with a lot of confidence, and they have they have walked themselves into a position. Good for them. You know, whatever they're doing over there. But the fact is, it's the people who who have that imposter syndrome, and it's largely the people who don't see themselves already in the games industry mm -hmm. that talk themselves out of it. It know. happens. Yeah. It happens in two ways. I find imposter syndrome affects people in two ways. One is not a particularly nice one, and I have found this: when people have imposter syndrome, they tend to project, and when they project, this is where game terminology is very annoying because they start to project it in a way where they are not all, and they start to hide behind phrases and terminology to appear that they know it all because they're afraid they're going to get caught out. So to someone who doesn't know them, actually the way that they're behaving makes that other person who's a bit more introverted go even more introverted because that person seems so confident and they seem so knowledgeable. But actually that's just their projection of their imposter syndrome then it hits the introverted person who feels even worse because they're like, well, I don't know what that, that phrase means. I don't know what that, that term means. That means I, I shouldn't be here. And it's just a tennis of mental health. <laughs> it really, really is. Uh, no one in this industry doesn't have imposter syndrome and see if they don't then they probably shouldn't be in it because really imposter syndrome is, is nerves and doubt and again it, it comes from a place of caring um the moment you you lose that then you know you might have just lost your love for it but everybody has it um so trust it no matter what shade of a human you're dealing with they're dealing with their own imposter syndrome they might just be presenting it differently nice Thanks for thanks for expanding on that. Yeah, it's an important topic, and yeah, as we say, it comes up everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a few. I can see some really good questions here that um, are largely to do with kind of like tools and mm -hmm. showcasing skills and portfolios and things like that. So I've, I've scrolled up and I found one from Crispy Bacon Bits, which is making me hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Crispy Bacon Bits. Um, so Crispy Bacon Bits says, are there any tools you would recommend for writing a narrative idea, such as mm -hmm. Twine or Artsy? colon draft i don't know what those are by the way okay. uh, and how would i showcase them on a portfolio so what i would say is i get a lot of portfolios with twine and i'm going to be brutally honest here does nothing for me uh, particularly twine is good to learn because it, it teaches you the, the, the background and how we've got to where we are i have yet to work for the studio and i've worked for Rocksteady, I've worked for Supercell, I've worked for Lucid Games, I've worked with Riot Games, I've worked with Playground Games, I've worked with PlayStation, I've Savage. 
none of them use twine. So I'm going to be honest, I've yet to come across one that does. There is probably one or two out there, but really twine is something that tends to get taught to students. But if you're going to show me what you can do, like I, I've never had to learn it. I've not put it that way. I am now at where I am and I've never even had to learn twine. Someone tried to get me to do it for a writing test and I had to say, I'm really sorry. I don't, I don't know how to use this and I can't learn it overnight. That is because the games industry has gone so fast and so quickly that they're just far more user friendly tools now like Artisy Draft. And don't get me wrong, Artisy Draft is still, you're going to need a couple of days to get your head around it. But that for me, is it's a lot more user friendly. And especially for story-led games with multiple characters and so on, uh, that that is a tool that we're more likely to use. Um, but to be honest, you don't even need that in your portfolio. It's good to have. See, even if you just have a spreadsheet and you're able to write down the triggers, what that trigger is there for, who the character is, what the line is, what I'm going to see from that spreadsheet is, um, I mean, I was, I was maybe going to share something, but I might get into trouble because it's not my IP. I was maybe going to try and show you guys a spreadsheet, but I think I'll be on the safe side. Um, but um, but I, I might uh, mock up a little demo somewhere just to, just to send out on the Discord. But really, if you can just show that, what that shows me is I'm looking at the trigger lists that you've came up with. So say, for example, it's a it's a it's a it's, it's a horde mission you know it's a horde mission and i want to see what your what your brain goes into and i want to see that the trigger list of dialogue lines that you think might pop up in that situation that shows me that you're thinking like a designer and that's all i need that is all i need to see that you've thought about it and that you've written it well as well because the tools are great but i just want to see how you design it because the tools are only there to for, for you to use to be able to to um to display your design but i'm more interested in how you design so don't worry too much about the tools twine is a little bit complicated and yes it's a flex and yes you're all probably brilliant you can you can use it and i can't but i don't have to so show me how you design it whack it on a spreadsheet if you have to don't worry so much because a lot of the studios that you're going to go into don't use artisy and they don't use unity and they don't use twine a lot of these studios are actually now at the stage especially microsoft um they make their own <laughs> They make their own tools in-house. So even if you are incredibly uh, literate on Artisy or Unity, uh, you're still going to have to learn a new tool. So don't worry too much about it. You can say in your CV that you know you do know how to use it, but I don't need the proof. I'm more interested in how you design. Hope that Brilliant. Answers. Yeah, no, 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 definitely. And that 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 thing about sort of um, studios having their own technologies. Yeah, oh. you do hear that in a lot of different um mm -hmm. you'll hear that in a lot of different professions and disciplines yes. as well. So so yes. definitely good and yeah, definitely good to hear it from a narrative side as well, because I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um going through the questions, um, we're getting we're getting close to the bottom of the list now. So if you've yes. been if you're biting your tongue because you think, oh, there's no time for my question, slam it in chat right now, please. Um, because if we reach the bottom of the list, then then Jonas is gonna go freeform and you don't want that. Um, so keeping me on a leash, I'm gonna read this question from Burdusk. Um, which I think it's quite a good question because I'm a career switcher myself. But um Burdusk has said, Have you encountered any sort of ageism for entry level roles essentially for older career changes um i realize it just may not apply in writing but also i think it is a good question you you definitely see um quite graduate positions that advertise and that feels very student focused that feels very sort of young person focused not open to career switches mm -hmm. um wondering how does that translate in your experience of, of writing and, and would it ever affect you if you were looking for a new writer it's 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 an important question because uh, how, how to put it, I've not experienced it directly, but I do believe that it does exist. What I can say is sometimes I've seen it go the other way as well. It's not just about older people coming in at an entry-level job. Sometimes it's younger people going for a senior job, but because they're so young, there is an ageism from people that are senior who are maybe 10 years, years older going, there's no way this person's where they need to be if they're only 21. For 22 so it's it goes both ways i think we're always going to be uh, living unfortunately in a world where there are going to be assumptions there what i can say in terms of ageism for older people get into to junior roles it really comes down to what skills you had before and what transferable skills you had before because that is is where it's going to get exciting uh if they're looking for a project um let's say and it's it's a war game 
and we have a, someone that's used to be in the military and that is someone I've came across before. Just having that experience of weapons and so on made them a really interesting candidate and that was regardless of age. It's It goes both ways. I think there, people can, and again, this is going to come down to personal insecurity as well. If you're feeling that you're getting knocked back all the time because you're too young, you're too old, you're a woman, you're black, whatever, you're going to go in with those insecurities anyway. Don't take the mass rejections as an indication that it's because of those things that you're worried about. The market is awful. The market is saturated. It's very difficult right now. Does ageism exist? Probably. Do I think it exists on a level where I think we're really concerned, that we should be really, really concerned? No, I do think sometimes hiring managers do need a kick up the backside sometimes just not to write someone off because really what their job is there is to read the CV in full. And if you have the skills there in full, if you have something interesting there, yeah. I mean, this is why I I, I never put my my uh, my age on a CV. I'm never going to do that. It used to be a long time. I wouldn't even say that my, my first name was female. I used to put K dot surname because I didn't even want them to know I was a woman. You know, it's it's we go in with these these kind of worries that there, there is an ism somewhere that will be held against us. You are going to come across someone who is going to see you as older and go, oh, you know, I can't mold them. I can't teach them. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Who are going to come across people like that? Fortunately, I do think that they are in the minority. And again, that goes for young people looking for senior roles. Again, you're going to get people where they're going to go, oh, no, well, I'm 10 years older than them. And I don't see someone that young being at the same level as me. Of course, it's going to happen. I don't think it's I don't think it's anything we need to be getting our pitchforks out with yet. I don't think anyone is really safe from from that kind of judgment. And, and again, that even goes for straight white males at, at the moment, you know, given the, the, the diversity hire, they're going into interviews thinking I'm not going to get picked because I don't tick a diversity box. It, it goes across the board. It goes across the board. And unfortunately, I, I think it probably exists across the board as well, but not for everyone. I, it's, it's such a hard question to answer. I don't want to say it doesn't exist. Of course, it's going to exist. But um, if if you're thinking this about yourself because of a flurry of projections, as hard as it is, try not to, to, to look at the thing that you're insecure about as a reason that you're not getting the job. As much as you can, as someone who's been through that, try. There's there's something really interesting that you mentioned there as well, which is just like, if someone has a personal experience, you know, coming from the military, for example, right, mm -hmm. then that is going to completely and utterly just like dispel any other distractions on that application and anything else from that person the fact is they have an experience that's really relevant um yeah. and so yeah like a takeaway from me there certainly is if you've got unique personal experiences like bring those to the front bring those forward yes they matter more than they matter more than a lot of your other identities because they're relevant to the job that you're going to be doing absolutely and just to add to this because i think this is very important to any applicant no matter who you are one thing i've noticed on the hiding side of things is i get writing samples that are very safe they're very safe they're very cookie cut again and the cv again is very safe it's very generic and then when i ask people why is why is this so generic you've told me you love horror why isn't that in there and their concern is that well if it's not a horror game then they might not they might not want me scrap that give me a horror script tell me you like horror show me the writer that you are because we get hundreds of safe cvs if you come in yes maybe i'm not making a horror game maybe you're not going to be my cup of tea but see the person that is making a horror game you are going to stand out tenfold because you stuck with your guns you stuck with your experience you stuck with what you like you stuck with your own style be brave because i can tell you now if you keep being it safe you're just going to join out with the noise so put, put it all in there get it in there um Speaking of, so, so you mentioned horror writing. Yeah. So the next thing I'll move into then is um, you have a bit of a genre specialty yourself yes. um, in comedy. Yes, I do. Um, and then, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just talk about it. what I can say is I'm also working on a horror movie right now. <laughs> what, what I find is comedy writers and horror writers are normally the same type of people. Uh, you'll notice there's a lot of comedy and horror crossover. And the reason for that is there's just a love for the element of surprise, whether it's making you scream, whether it's making you laugh, that's what we live for. That's where our God complex lies. So yes, no, I did start in comedy. I was uh, I started as a stand-up when I was 19 years old and did that for six years and thought I was gonna do that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And what they say is, is that you either get performers who are trying to write or writers that are trying to perform. 
And I was very quickly realizing that I was a writer that was trying to perform because I didn't have like a, a character I, or it would change every week. One week I'd be deadpan and I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm the deadpan comic. And then I'd maybe die on my ass and I'd go, oh, it's not working. And then I'd go back to myself and then I'd try. I had no strong voice, but my writing, dare I say it, was definitely stronger than my performing. And that's when other comics started to come to me to ask if I would write jokes for them on panel shows. And that's when I went, this seems to be what I'm better <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to invite me on because I'm not a good enough performer but they like my writing so they're going to take me on as a writer and uh, so that's how it went into comedy writing and to give to put it as quickly as, as I can I went from comedy writing to wanting to be again the next Edgar Wright I wanted to write the next space so I was grabbing a camera and getting friends and even the worst stuff you've ever seen I really hope it never comes to light it was terrible but you know again talking about holding a pen for the first time, expect your firsts to be awful, but run with it because you're going with passion and hunger. I would make things myself that no one would ever want to, to make. I would write scripts that no one ever wanted to make. And, and that was why I made stuff because no one wanted to, to make the scripts. And it was only eventually, again, interview training, interview training, interview training, having a meltdown and turning up to that exec producer that finally got me a place where he could turn around and deny that I wasn't trying, put it that way. I was trying so hard. I was gigging, I was writing, I was writing scripts, I was you know, do, doing anything that person could possibly do to get a break. And yeah, that, that that's that's how my comedy thing really started. I think it's um comedy will never leave me, no matter no matter what I do. Sometimes I write comedy and don't even realize I'm doing it. It's like a nervous tick. I see you no, know, it's like a rubber band. I see you no know, get very, 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 very serious, and then I have to just let it ping for a second it's like a coming up for air um it's, it's definitely in the blueprint of what I write so anything I have written it normally has a comedic element in fact I do remember applying for a Spider-Man for Insomniac and they didn't choose me they didn't choose me and the feedback was is they did say she's definitely more of a comedy writer that's just not quite what we're looking for and that's totally fine that's totally fine I stood out they didn't want me but it is why Rocksteady did want me. And it is why Fable, which is a funny game, did want me because they started to notice a pattern in my writing. So again, stand out. Make sure that you stand out with what you love. Because yes, I'm a comedy person. And that is why people started to pick me up for things because I got known for that style. Uh, you will have your own, whatever it is. But, um, but yeah, comedy is kind of what got me here in the end. <laughs> and... Uh, to, to sort of highlight, sort of expand on that just a little bit more in terms of like, yeah. if someone thought, I think I want to write comedy, like I, mm. I, I think that's the way I want to go. Is there a way, is there a way that someone gets better at it? Like that obviously there's, there's certain parts that are just your personality that you can't learn someone else's personality. Mm -hmm. But how mm -hmm. does someone, how does someone learn or improve comedy you know is that something that you have you kind of gone through that that um that improvement process that that development i think for me stand up was was very important um because you're gonna know if it's funny or not very quickly <laughs> as soon as you're on stage that is probably the biggest crucible of, of working at your craft there but what i will say is it starts with making yourself laugh don't look at another comedian and go oh i could maybe copy that style make yourself laugh first think about something even if it's a memory that you have but the last time where you really gutted yourself laughing think about that and write it down there's there's a very good uh, phrase that uh, can be uh, uh, a comic that I work with called John Maloney I uh, used to say and he used to say the funny person is not the person that's always telling the joke the funny person is the person that, that spots the joke because there's there's humor and things that aren't even meant to be funny think about those moments that make you laugh think about what you as a comedy writer from your perspective had to have to offer comedy as well what do you have to offer that art form what is it about your voice that's missing right now and then sit down make yourself laugh think about it from your perspective and then the next thing it is and it is scary it is showing it to people because it, it is a scary thing people used to ask me as a stand-up they would say oh do you do an edition do you do this or do you do, you do an edition do you write things down and send it and I was like no I turned up when I was 19 still a bit hungover because I was at uni uh, I went on stage for five minutes and and that was it that was it and very quickly you learn what works and what doesn't and in stand-up I can tell you they always say in your first year of comedy stand-up you will probably die in your ass one out of three times then but then you keep practicing the thing is is getting back because once you die for the first time it's the worst feeling in the world but then you realize it's never going to be this bad again the first is the worst it's 
awful because people don't just look at you and go, oh, you're not funny. They look at you and go, that's a wee shame. She's not well. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> you have to like, like sneak out of the club. But one in three, but by the second year, it should be one in six. By the third year, it should be one in 10. And that is practice, 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 practice. And the same goes for writing. Write the jokes, make them funny, keep keep it at people reading it. And people that you trust, by the way, don't just fling it on a forum with people that you don't know. Get people that you trust to read it. Get, uh, you know, maybe even work with a, a comedian for a while if you want to, to, to see if it works. If you're brave enough, just get up and do five minutes. Five minutes of your life to see if this style is working. What, what, however it works for you, just trust it. it ha at the end of the day, it has to start with you finding it funny. Because I see this happen with comedy writers and comedians. The moment they stop finding their jokes funny, it's almost like a magic goes. And, and I don't know what happens or how it happens. But no matter how well they perform or how well they write, if they don't believe it's funny, it shows. So start with what you think is funny. And never, ever veer away from that. Even if one person says, I don't like it, if you still like it, keep it. Nice. There's a real common theme as well here of, of like backing yourself you know the fact is, is if, if you have confidence in, in the writing in the comedy and in yourself then then it takes time and it and, and time is the only thing that we can't really like do anything about here but um it, yeah. it sounds like that that is a key ingredient to sort of making sure that that, that success can happen later down we, in life we have a slogan at the comedy club before you go on stage and it's called the stand comedy club and it says abandon all dignity here and it's such a brutal phrase. But here's the thing, no one is born brilliant into these things. You're going to have to get humble. You're going to get embarrassed. You're going to get ashamed. You're going to get very red in the face a lot of the times. But it's going to be worth it because every single person that you look up to has been through the exact same things. So just trust. Trust in it and keep going. Nice. Um, I'm going to, as we're sort of rolling up to one hour now, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm doing a quick scroll of the questions, but there's definitely a question that I spotted um okay. that i'm pretty sure i'm gonna zoom in on um but yeah there's, there's a lot of commenting and, and adding to things that you've said already um and that they're, they're all really brilliant um and so please do take read through those if you can but thank you everyone for all your positive comments thanks for really engaging with chat and thanks for sort of chatting to each other as well while we while we sort of are still 20 questions behind you um Let's let's get so there, there's there's a questions from um, the Synapse UK, um, which I'll I'll sort of read out. So um, Synapse UK, I'd like to give my students some narrative basics, you know, where to start, like the building blocks stuff you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And I think just to really wrap it up, it's like, yeah, let let's assume that I didn't even know some of the foundations, right, of like storytelling, like how to tell a story where would I start? How would I learn that? What what are some terms and phrases that I should be googling and making a note of and sort of looking for? What are some good resources in this way? How can someone mm -hmm. just start? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is such a big question because especially if you are teaching people, the one thing that you do need to teach them right away is how very different games are. Okay, games are all incredibly different. You know, you can get sandbox games, cozy games, mobile games, huge multiplayer open model games, and they all have very na different narrative demands. Okay, so one thing I would actually recommend to you is to start looking at the Bartle theory, which was in 1996. And that actually gives you the four very first uh, coined player types, and what their motivations are. OK, now I would start there because because if you look at that theory, it will start to tell you these are the player types. These are the types of games that they like to play. Now, these are the types of games that they like to play based on that player's behavior type. Narratively, what do we need to bring in? So let's say people like a story led RPG game that that's what they like to do. They're going to love character. They're going to love lore. They're going to love world building. So I would start looking at that. OK, start looking at that kind of everything as a story. And it's such a corny phrase, but. The world is a character too, but it is. It absolutely is. Every single location is telling you something about this world. So say, for example, something terrible happens to this planet and let's say there's been an alien invasion, right? Every single location that you go to should be telling the story about how it's been impacted where it stands on it, what the opinions of the locals are and why. And then what you're doing is you're gonna lace that into what we call the main path. The main path is the main story. Sometimes it's called a campaign and that is the main story that you're doing. But in terms of building blocks around it, think of the world as, as a character as well, how all these locations are characters. Then think, 
who is the person that I should be following through this story or people that I should be following through this story? Because everything should be about lacing themes in and in and in again, okay? So this is the narrative side of things. Think about the world, think about the locations, think about the characters whose perspectives we should be following. Then think about the challenges they should be coming across and why it is that character that has to go through this challenge. Then think about if I took this character away, what would happen to the story? you know, find the purpose that they all have. And that's how I would start at a very basic level. In terms of character development, which I think you touched on earlier, wants and needs of the characters are, are, are very different things. So I'd focus on that inner conflict, then take that inner conflict, look at the threat that's going out in the world and go, okay, how would someone with this inner conflict react to something like that? And how thematically can I mirror the conflict in here to the to the conflict that's going out there. You know, this is the kind of the weaving that we start to do narratively. It's such a big question, and I'm sorry if this is a, if it's a bit of a murky answer. There's just a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot there. Um, but hopefully that'll give you some very quick uh, fire ways. Look at the Bartle theory, player types, types of games, the type of narrative that they need, and then work it work it out from there. Um, hopefully that will give some pointers to start with. Sorry. Big, big no, 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 no. Do, do, not, do not apologize. Yeah, no, the bigger the question, the harder it is to, to cover it all. But I think um, at the very least, right, those are some really great starting mm -hmm. points that will just, you know, people just need a square one often, right? You know, they, the, the yeah. first step in any direction really makes a big difference. It's, it's just such um, a crazy thing because step one is different things depending on the game. So it's just like, oh. <laughs> I, I suppose, yeah, step one, figure out the game, figure out the yeah. game type, figure out, you know, figure out your Absolutely. relationship and, and and what, you know, figure out what your ideal end goal is. Mm -hmm. this. But there's there's a hundred different ways to 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 get it right. And uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that all the Absolutely. advice will be useful to everyone. And on that note, what I will say is no studio goes in to make a game. I know it's completely from start to finish how it's going to go. It's an industry that is so young. Every single game has problems and issues that they never foresaw coming because it's such an experimental art form even today. So it really adds to that sense of no one knows what they're doing. Always trust that no one knows what they're doing. They're just doing their best and narrative is included in that. So, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with all of that, I think we're going to have to to wind it quietly now to a, to a mm -hmm. close. Um, but that this has just been such a like balloon filled uh, sort of hour of of, of experience and knowledge. Um, I've learned so much. I mean, of course, I have. I'm not uh, I'm not a narrative designer or writer, but um, I, I I feel so humbled to have sort of um, had you tell me all of these personal experiences and your personal insights into all of this. Um, mm -hmm. And I love the comedy angle as well. <laughs> um it's it's also fun and cool and, and just special so thank you so much for <laughs> giving us your time um and just just one more time because because we we, we got to mention it but yeah if if you've enjoyed listening to kim today and you've really felt that kim is someone that you could learn a lot more from i mean for one that is just 100 percent true for everyone like we can all learn a lot from everyone, but especially Kim. Um, but there is the Sprint course that uh, Intergames is hosting. And while the one that starts in April has sold out, the one in July, uh, as of when I last checked, still has a few uh, available spaces. So um, if you're really keen to kind of uh, level up your your ability to, to sort of write and uh, particularly write for games, um, Kim is a fantastic person to, to work alongside. So please go check that out. Um, if you've got any questions that you feel were unanswered or something that comes to mind later and you're like, oh, I wish I'd asked that question, um, please do join the Intergames Discord. There is a link in the YouTube. Uh, other YouTubers record it, the doobly do years ago. Um, there's a there's a, a little section down below. The description of the video should have an invite link yes. to the Discord. Um, uh, once you're in, please do look for the channel that's called Questions and Answers. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, thank you so much. Any parting words of wisdom uh, before you go? Anything that you just just underline the entire chat? Words of wisdom. Oh my goodness. I will be on the Discord, by the way, for at least half an hour afterwards. And again, do find me on Twitter at Kim McCaskill1 if, if you're not on the Discord. Parting words of wisdom, I, I would say, is don't be hard on yourself. If, if you're looking to enter this industry or advance in this industry, recognize it is incredibly difficult. Uh, so try and be your own biggest fan in this because rejections are not because of you. You're not doing anything wrong. 
So don't, as difficult as it is, don't let it break you down because it's not about you. It's about the state of the industry. Trust that you have something to offer and don't let that be be stamped out by any other thing. Just, yeah, that's probably it. And you're always learning. You're always learning. Ne never, ever think that you're not going to learn because that, that never stops either. Cool. Thank you so much. I hope everyone got that because I had a little Wi-Fi glitch just there. Um, I really apologise if that disrupts your, 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 yeah, your final really underline. I, just... <laughs> um, I don't mean to sabotage you uh, at the at the the final minute. Um, <laughs> but I think that's probably a good signal then that um, we can bring this to a close. So thank you again, Kim, so much. Um, this has been an absolute joy. Thank you, audience. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, viewers. Um, for, for giving you all your questions and, and chatting with us. Um, it's It's been really so lovely to, to engage with you all. Um, we will be doing a few more of these now, just basically throughout the year, all the time. So um, keep an eye on the Intergames YouTube channel, keep an eye on the Discord, keep an eye on the LinkedIn. Um, I will do my best to communicate when events like this pop up. Um, they they might be in different subjects and disciplines, in which case that's an opportunity for, for people to learn from, from all different backgrounds. Um, or who knows, maybe we'll talk about similar subjects again and we can really dig into things that have been left unsaid. Um, I'm going to click the end stream now button rather unceremoniously. You're just going to be ripped away from the, the comfort of our hands. So thank you, everyone, and goodbye once again. Bye-bye. <laughs>